Well, we continue in the season of Epiphany, that time in the church year when we focus on how Jesus is revealed into the world. Today, we turn to the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. We have heard in the past several weeks of his baptism by John the Baptist. And we have echoes from the nativity scene where the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. We hear that echoed as Jesus begins his public ministry, not in Jerusalem, not in his hometown of Nazareth, but in the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali. He settles, makes a new home in Capernaum, which is on this shore of the Sea of Galilee. I was able, with a clergy group, to tour the Holy Land about 15 years ago. In fact, the former rector of St. Barnabas, Father Keith Whittingham, was my roommate on that tour. We more or less followed the historical life of Jesus on the tour. So it was very early on in the tour that we found our way to Capernaum. And it was an idyllic sight along this Sea of Galilee, which reminded me of some of the northern lakes of Ontario or back home in Wisconsin. I was there on a beautiful day. The waves were only gently lapping onto the, onto the stony beach. The air was clear. It was tranquil. And in that area, we went to visit the ruins of an ancient synagogue, one that was probably built on top of the synagogue that we hear Jesus is teaching in, in that village of Capernaum. Remember being stirred by that sense of being in that sacred space where Jesus would have taught. Then we wandered over to what might have been the site of one of Jesus' miracles where he healed Simon's, Peter's mother-in-law. And just a short bus ride south of that site was this beautiful hillside which overlooked the Sea of Galilee thought, perhaps, to be where Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, some of which we will read next Sunday. It was all really very tranquil and peaceful. And I imagined Andrew and Peter and James and John and eventually a growing crowd of people coming to listen to Jesus, his great spiritual teacher, and finding peace in his words. But I may have been wrong in that idyllic sense. It could be argued that what we read in today's gospel is actually the beginning of a political movement that Jesus began in that town of Capernaum. It could be argued that people gathered around him, not so much because of the peace that he offered them, but that he was saying it is time for the world to be transformed. The 
The passage begins with Jesus' cousin John the Baptist being arrested. Arrested by Herod, one of those who has this strange connection between the religious people of the day, the Jews, the king of the Jews, and his political, offic- uh, political connections with the Roman Empire. The Romans, I found, as I looked over this beautiful park-like setting, the Romans had a garrison in Capernaum. It was a place where they collected the taxes of the people who were traveling along this trade route. While you and I might think of fishing on a northern lake as a pleasant, leisurely pastime, Peter and Andrew, James and John, were very much likely to have been peasants barely squeaking out a living, hauling out the fish, and the best ones being shipped off to the rich and powerful in other parts of the region. They would be left with the dregs. And any income they earned was heavily taxed by the Romans. So when they heard that message, I'm going to make you fishers of people, they were probably ready to get out of the fishing business. And I stumbled across a kind of a, a, well, a theologian, but also an activist by the name of Chad Myers. He wrote a book a couple of decades ago called Binding the Strong Man. And in it, he opened my eyes to the reality of what Peter and Andrew and James and John might have heard when they said, I'm going to make you fishers of people. He pointed out a couple of Old Testament, and that's the Bible that those men knew the Bible that Jesus had studied for the many years before he begins this ministry. He refers to three references to fishing for people in the Old Testament. From Jeremiah chapter 16, beginning at verse 16, I am now sending for many fishermen, says the Lord, and they shall catch them. And afterward, I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the clefts of the rocks. For my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from my presence, nor is their iniquity concealed from my sight." This is not a tranquil, idyllic kind of picture of a leisurely activity. From Amos chapter 4, verse 2, the Lord God has sworn by his holiness, the time is surely coming upon you when they shall take you away with hooks, even the last of you with fish hooks. And from the prophet Ezekiel. I'll I'll read a little bit more here from the chapter, from chapter 29, to give a more fulsome context of fishing for people. In the tenth year, in the tenth month, on the twelfth day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. 
mortal, set your face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Speak and say, thus says the Lord God, I am against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon sprawling in the midst of its channels saying, my Nile is my own, I made it for myself. I will put hooks in your jaws and make the fish of your channels stick to your scales. I will draw you up from your channels with all the fish of your channels sticking to your scales. I will fling you into the wilderness, you and all the fish of your channels. You shall fall in the open field and not be gathered and buried. To the animals of the earth and to the birds in the air, I will give you as food. Yikes! This may well have been the beginning of a political movement. What if we consider ourselves as the disciples, along with Peter and Andrew, James and John, that we follow in a long line of disciples called to follow Jesus, we, like the disciples, we gather in community to listen to Jesus' words as they did for three years. But always in the background that with Jesus, we are being called to be transformative agents in the world. We are need, we, like those early disciples, need to be aware of the injustices, the realities of far too many people in our world who are being oppressed, who are suffering under systems that discriminate against them, that hold them down. We are called to follow Christ. And as that journey through the Holy Land continued, you know where the bus was heading, towards the Holy City, Jerusalem where Jesus went into the temple and stirred it up, flipping over the money table, money changers' tables, calling for the temple of the day to be reformed. We follow Jesus to his cross in our liturgy, I do it physically by going up to the altar and to commemorate his sacrifice. We say we lay the sacrifice of our own souls and bodies on that altar to be with Christ. then we are fed by him. We are fed with the hope that in, by him, through him, with him, that his light will overcome the darkness. We are reminded that God chooses to dwell among us, within us, that he chooses to nurture us and to lead us into a world of peace 
and justice. So may we, like those very early disciples, Peter and Andrew, James and John, might we recommit ourselves to that sense of disruption that Jesus was bringing into that oppressed place, that sense that things are not as they should be, but that that sense that, that with him and by his example, and as we grow in our love for him, as we are nourished in this place in our souls, that our hearts and minds and bodies might take up with him a commitment to the transformation of the world in which we live. So might we, with great determination, commit ourselves to follow Jesus, to learn from him, to be healed by him, be empowered by his spirit that we might become more and more like him and in so doing participate in the transform, transformation of people's lives and the world in which they lived. May that, may we, like Peter and Andrew, James and John, and so many others down through the years, through the millennia, join in that great mission of reconciliation and transformation, of seeking peace and justice. In his name, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.